So um, we lower the cost of the backstop now. Um, well, now we don't have any rent adjustment because our last pool, last, the last pool being utilized, has no rent. So there's no rent to decrease. What we do have is less, uh, is that both types of consumers are going to switch to the backstop sooner. Uh, and you have fewer emissions. You have less cumulative consumption of the high cost pool. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. So uh, the other thing though that we have as well um, is that the emissions factors may differ between the two pools. So the high cost pool may be more emissions intensive, like oil sands are more emissions intensive to upgrade and um, and extract than conventional uh, oil. Um, so in this case then, um, you know, when the emissions factors are the same, the unregulated and regulated switch from the low cost pool to the high cost pool at the same time. Because, um, because the tax, you know, if you th think of the decision they're making, they switch whenever the next one becomes cheaper or, you know, the same price. So the, um, um, and, the, and if you're in the regulated sector region, the tax applies on both the low cost and the high cost pool, and that just washes out, because you're looking at when those, those costs are the same. So they switch at the same time. But if the emissions factors are different, then those two switchover equations are gonna be different, and the high, and um, the, uh, tax users are going to want to stay longer on the low cost pool, the less emissions intensive pool, and switch later than the um, unregulated. So it looks something like that. Because they want to avoid the higher tax cost of the other pool. Okay, so um, in this case you actually get some kind of novel results in that accelerating the backstop cost reductions can actually generate negative leakage. So, um, so you have, um, if these emissions factors differ sufficiently, then increasing your emissions tax in the regulated um, region, it depends uh, um, sort of on, on this timing issue. But um, let me look for the relevant case. Okay, so this is where you, this is the unregulated and the regulated consumer. So in the case where the so the unregulated always go from the low to high backstop. If the regulated consumers are going straight from the low uh, cost pool to the backstop, um, you can get negative leakage. So it's increasing um, the tax um, makes them yeah. So increases the um, regulated. Uh, so the regulated consumers switch earlier to the backstop, so that decreases their cumulative demand for the low cost, lower emissions pool, and, and so then the unregulated consume from that pool longer before switching to the high cost pool, and then they always switch out of the high cost pool at the same time because that's determined by whenever it hits the backstop. Um, price. So then they, they consume for a shorter time on the relatively more emissions intensive pool. So you have emissions reductions in that case um, from the unregulated um, as well as the regulated. Okay, and what's interesting is so then um, is what also happens with the shadow value uh, so the rents on the low cost pool is you're essentially kind of um, you know bidding up demand um, for for the low less emissions intensive resource. So you get some counterintuitive effects. Okay, so the next thing we do is we want to calibrate um, our uh, we we do a five pool model, kind of a stylized five pool model of that IEA graph you saw. Um, and so we get uh, sort of their information, kind of the central estimates, the um, reserves estimates, the production cost, 
we get relative emissions factors from the EPA. You know, there are some pretty significant differences, especially. So uh, oil sands is um, like a quarter more emissions intensive than conventional oil, and oil shale is twice as emissions intensive. Uh, okay. So then you can think about, well, if our cumulative emissions goal is X, what policy combinations get us there in terms of it for what coalition size. Okay, so we have the backstop marginal cost, constant marginal cost declining. It's exponentially. Um, uh, and then we use just a linear demand but calibrated to um, forecast uh, growth for oil demand by EIA and uh, some estimates of the elasticity of demand from the literature. This actually implies a choke price of a little over $200. We assume a fairly low interest rate of 2%. Think of that as like a risk-free rate of return, perhaps. Um, and uh, this doesn't matter so much, but we calculate, we want to start at that second uh, equilibrium of interest. So, so we calculate the cost reducing technological change that would just um, so that you wouldn't have any rents on oil shale. So that's you know the last pool that we want to exploit. So that would get rid of the rents, but we still be just consuming all of it. So just as a point to start with and then look at what happens when we start making any of our policies more stringent. So this sort of implies that we'll have um, exhaustion without any policy intervention by the end of the century. Okay, so, um, uh, so what happens here? So this is a little tricky to, um, to get at, but so here, remember we have these two kinds of um, situations one where the regulated consumers, you know, go from low to high and then the backstop. So here um, they're consuming, uh, so this is, we're looking at the penultimate resource pool, which is oil sands in this case. And so this is looking at a situation where the regulated consume some uh, uh, oil shale, so the last pool. And then this is the border where you've made it stringent enough that they want to go straight from oil sands to the backstop, okay? And so we see that we have different policy effects depending on which side of this border we're on. So we set sort of a policy combination that, that's just on this border and then we look at deviations with individual policies and look at what happens to the left and right. Okay, so here, so if you're just on the border now, and say with your existing coalition, you, um, uh, okay, this is the reduction in cumulative emissions. So you say reducing the tax to the left of that, um, this actually decreases the rent. So, I mean, starting from this point where you have no, no emissions target, as you increase your emissions tax, the, um, the rent uh, on oil sands, so the penultimate uh, resource that is less emissions intensive than oil shale by a significant amount, that rent is going up because you're increasing demand for their lower emissions stuff. But then once you get to this point where the regulators aren't consuming any, any oil, um, any of the last one, then as you increase this, um, the, the rents are going to fall. Okay, and the increasing the coalition size has a similar effect up until the point where the regulators are going to skip oil shale and go straight to the backstop, and then you continue to increase the coalition, you actually continue to increase the rent for oil sands. Whereas innovation always, it either has no effect uh, it has no effect on the rent for oil sands because you know you're switching to that you're always switching at the same time to the high cost oil or 
um, once you get to this point, it has a decreasing ef effect on the red foil sands because they're switching sooner and sooner, the, the regulators are switching sooner and sooner, the backstop and consuming less oil sands. So, um, so you get these sort of differing effects depending on what kind of equilibrium you're in. Um, and so this, is, so to sort of cast this a little bit in the leakage uh, vein, um, so this is our target for percentage reduction and cumulative emissions and what's going on with the folks who aren't in the coalition. Well, if you're using a tax or um, increase emissions tax and or increasing the share of the world that's regulated with an emissions tax, uh, you do see positive leakage. Um, uh, and it's growing up until this point where, again, where the regulateds are skipping the last pool and then you see leakage um, starting to decline in the case of the tax, but for the coalition, it, it continues to go up. Innovation, on the other hand, always has negative leakage because it always um, gets the unregulated to switch sooner to the clean backstop and consume less of the, the last resource pool. So that's sort of the negative leakage. You can also think about this in terms of Okay, what co policy combinations do we get? What is the minimum coalition size that we need to get a certain amount of emissions reductions? Okay, as you can think of it as, well, the maximum tax policy that we can implement would just eliminate all demand for oil from the coalition, from the regulated countries. They just go straight to the backstop. So that's the most that you can do with an emissions tax. Uh, within your coalition. So assuming that we can eliminate demand for oil from uh, the regulated, then what is the minimum coalition size we need to meet a certain emissions reduction? So this is sort of an exercise to think through, so what do these borderline divisions look like? So you have a trade-off between the share of aggregate demand that's regulated versus the speed of technological innovation. Okay, and so this is what it looks like for um, saying getting, um, uh, so these are the policy combination, the coalition size and technology policy combinations that um, get you to leave this, you know, the respective pool in the ground. Okay, so we see to, you know, keep shale oil in the ground, um, you know, it, it can take just, if you have like no one in the coalition, then a rate of technical change will under uh, 10%. Um, I forget if this is annual or decadal, sorry. Um, uh, we'll get you there. Um, and uh, for to leave oil sands in the ground, you need a little more technological change or a little more participation in the coalition. But I guess the, the takeaway though is that to, to keep any of these cheap Exxon you know, resources in the ground, you either need massive technological change, really rapid innovation in the backstop, or a really big coalition, or some combination of pretty rapid and a pretty big coalition. Okay. Um, to try to get a little bit more realistic, so then we try to think through, well, what are some plausible coalitions, and then what does that um, look like in terms of the policies that we would need to get um, you know, to leave some of these pools in the ground. Um, again, a, a good share of the emissions are coming from, you know, the highest cost, highest emitting resources also have the largest reserves. So limiting those gets you um, a good chunk of more than half of the emissions from oil, much more than half. Um, but so the other thing that we can see is that Okay, if you sort of, if you think you can convince all the developed countries to join a coalition, mm -hmm. 
And you still have to worry a little bit because their share of energy consumption, global energy consumption, is declining over time. Okay, so um, you know, right now they're like maybe 45 percent, and then by 2035 they estimate it'll be maybe a third of global energy consumption. So taking into into account that the coalition size is uh, sort of evolving over time. Um, you can think about, well, what would it take for um, the OECD to uh, eliminate demand for oil shale? Okay. And it turns out that pretty modest policies can do this. So you can think of just a $10 carbon tax in a coalition of OECD countries, you know, without pushing on technological change. Um, in this case, the coalition would be expected to skip over the oil sands too and go straight to the backstop. Or with no tax, um, okay, so here's the baseline that we have. Um, you can just increase the improvement in your uh, backstop cost from 5.1% uh, per decade to 5.7% per decade. So it's a little bit of an acceleration and bringing those costs down. Um, okay, so eliminating demand for uh, oil sands, so heavy oil, um, now it gets a bit harder. So the OECD cannot do this by itself without speeding up technological change. It just can't. So, um, so then we look at scenarios that have, so you could combine, say, a $20 carbon tax with a 10.3 cost improvement for decades. So the lower your carbon tax, the faster your improvement has to be. $40 carbon tax and 9.7 cost improvement for decade. Or if you can't tax, okay, do innovation. Um, and so basically 12% cost improvement for decade would get that. So this is in a bit of a contrast to the Green Paradox literature, which is very down on technology policies. You know, what are they good for? Nothing, accelerating emissions. When you start to incorporate leakage and these opportunities for cumulative emissions reductions, technology policies actually become useful. And even without, so our last paper didn't have the spatial leakage aspect, and even then, um, you know, there's also this question, well, how much do we really need to worry about the possibility of a strong green paradox? Like, how strong are these acceleration effects? So, so we checked that here in this uh, model. So, um, so looking at the scenarios that we just saw for uh, keeping oil sands and shale, oil shale in the ground. Um, so we use as a proxy for this potential green paradox effect, well, how fast are we going to go through the low cost oil? How, how many years until we exhaust the, the MENA, the Middle East uh, uh, low cost oil? Um, and so, and this, so this is with no policy at all. Okay, if we rely solely on uh, and so then these three policies meet our sort of emissions target. So if we just use technology, yeah, it, ex it accelerates um, exhaustion a little bit. If we use a tax, especially the high tax, it stretches out exhaustion a little bit. But all of these are like a fraction of a year. So, so you can think about whether you think that can plausibly have have effects on the present discounted value of, of climate damages. Um, okay, so uh, just to wrap up and then we can uh, maybe have some discussion. Um, so we really find that clean energy innovation is a valid policy measure and it's actually a substitute for coalition size when you take into account uh, in incomplete regulation. Um, so we find that by you know, making a future backstop more competitive, uh, you know, it allows you to achieve emissions reductions with maybe a smaller 
uh, coalition that you would need otherwise. Um, so this is really in contrast to the uh, earlier green paradox models that really focused on timing issues and, and complete extraction um, and, and innovation policy was, was only a, potentially a bad thing. Um, and so then the question is, you know, what do we think is easier? <laughs> um, uh, do we think it's easier to negotiate and try to bring more, more of the world under the umbrella that's regulating carbon and putting a price on carbon? Or is it easier to innovate and come up with alternative energy um, technologies that can be shared uh, with the rest of the world and encourage everyone to reduce their emissions? Um, so, I mean, what we don't have in here to do sort of, you know, welfare analysis is we don't know what the cost of these policies are. We don't know what the cost is of accelerating innovation. We don't know what the cost is of recruiting more people <laughs> into, the, uh, uh, into the coalition. So it's hard to do welfare analysis in this. We had the same problem in our last paper where we looked at a larger array of policies including energy efficiency policies and um, and uh, like uh, biofuel mandates, so you know, like mark renewable share mandates, uh, etc. Um, and the other, so the other things I think that might be interesting to think about is to drill down more into the process of technological change. So we are assuming here basically perfect international spillovers of technological change. So that you know, so if we're thinking of this being the coalition doing doing the R and D for the technologies, are they just going to give the clean technologies away, or well, sell them at the same price to? Uh, uh, unregulated countries, so they're sort of perfect international spillovers. Um, so that might be something to think about. What if uh, you know there are some endogenous incentives for uh, engaging in technological change? So as you conduct uh, in, in both the unregulated and the regulated region, so as you um, change your climate policy, that changes the rents on fossil fuels that changes, um, you know, how attractive it is to invest in alternatives. Um, yeah, so we've really abs abstracted about how technological change is brought about and what that costs. So it would be interesting to to think of think about ways to incorporate that more directly. Um, you know, like in some you know, uh, some of the macro. Uh, type growth models, thinking about this. Uh, anyway, so I will just say thanks to my Swedish and Norwegian funders and see if y'all have any questions or comments. Thanks. <laughs> Good R. Just a reflection. I feel like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter. <laughs> um, just a reflection. It seems like uh, like uh, someone in the Bush administration that uh, kind of come up with this uh, paper. <laughs> because well, wasn't that what uh, we were so surprised that everybody in Sweden was so you know rallied for mm. the Copenhagen COP and and out of a sudden we read in the paper that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, had this new initiative with with um, China and India about technology. Um, Kind of, uh, we had already gone rid of Bush by Copenhagen. Huh? Bush was gone by Copenhagen. No, no, that, yeah. Uh, okay. what I'm say, that's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. Everybody else were kind of you know, yeah. gearing up towards that, but but instead they they went off to on a completely mm. different uh, uh, tack, which is actually right. Yeah. Um, you know, I th I think in part it it would be, is partly this idea, but I think is also a lot about, um, 
you know, competitiveness concerns too. So like in the debate over climate policy in the US, there's, uh, you know, there are a lot of senators that just n no way that we'll do anything if uh, China and India are, if, you know, major manufacturing competitors are not also undertaking similar policies. Right. But yeah, so there was this sort of focus on technology and delay. But I mean, none of this, uh, you know, the other thing that would though, you know, if we can think about, so posit a cost of, of technology, then we can also think about, well, what are the efficiency costs of this? Because, you know, an optimal climate policy, I mean, you'll have some technological change, but you'll also have a car, you'll definitely have a carbon price. So, um, there is an efficiency cost to having a lower carbon price or a less than complete coalition. And, and part of that is going to be, you know, the extra cost, the extra investment that you have to do to push technology a lot harder than you would otherwise. And so, yeah, and thinking about endogenous technology, so normally, you know, if uh, carbon pricing, one of the advantages of carbon pricing is also think you're raising the return to innovation and clean technology. So if you don't have that, then you have to supplement with other efforts. But, um, but this idea of like getting, trying to get emissions reductions out of countries that don't have formal climate policies, you know, is a pretty powerful aspect of technology mm -hmm. policy. Can you summarize yeah. the sort of the intuition between the, behind the negative uh, leakage idea? Uh, the negative leakage part, yeah. So the, um, let me see if I can go back to the, so if you um, get to this point here where the um, regulated consumers are skipping the last resource pool, okay, so the tax is high enough um, that they just want to go straight from the, or technological improvement is fast enough, they want to go straight from the low cost pool to the backstop and not consume any out of the, um, the last pool. Um, additional policies that then, you know, decrease their demand for the penultimate pool, for the low cost pool in this case, freeze up, so that pool still has rents. Okay, that pool is, all, is still going to be exhausted. So if you decrease their demand for the low cost pool, that frees up more for the unregulated to consume out of that pool. Okay, so the rents go down, and, um, um, but the net, the net effect is that, you know, because these guys are consuming less of it, these guys stay longer in the low cost pool, so this shifts down like this, so they start the high cost, more emissions intensive, this only occurs if the high cost pool is also more emissions intensive, okay? So they start the more emitting pool later, and they still get out of it at the same time, because it has no rents to be able to adjust, uh, you know, and, uh, and switch to the backstop. So that's, that's how you can get the sort of negative leakage effect because if this this pool is dirtier then you can um, by reducing demand among the regulators for the low cost pool it frees up and allows the unregulators to switch later to the dirty pool because you're always going to fully exhaust the low cost pool in this in this scenario so it depends on when you go in and when you go out of the high cost pool yeah I have two observations. Yeah. Um, how about technological change that actually increases the efficiency of consumption of dirty oil? Right. So that's going to work in, in a different direction. So if you have cost reducing technical change in the fossil resources again, then um, you'll have uh, okay, in the multiple pool that gets interesting because then that has cascade effects that lowers rents in the, in the pools before it. Um, so you do have, uh, so, uh, 
more emissions, and then you switch later to the backstop because the cost, the cost is lower. So, and it's going to be sort of, I think though for a lot, uh, it can be sort of similar to ha just having relatively higher costs in the backstop. Um, so yeah, so we don't have, um, you know, that, that comes up because there still is, you know, a fair amount of ongoing innovation in uh, fossil resources as well. So um, I guess the question is, are, is it sufficient to say, well, we're sort of looking at the relative rate of innovation, so that's that much faster that the backstop has to do. But also, you know, what we're not getting at either is that that some of the innovation can also reduce the emissions intensity of those uh, higher cost pools. Yeah. And uh, the second observation is. But if you're not going to want to use them, if you if you have a credible climate policy that makes you think you're not really going to want to use a lot of that, then that's also less incentive to innovate in them. Yeah. So, um, um, is the assumption is the fact that. Um, Consumption of oil is expanding in the developing countries relevant for this framework. Yeah, so that's why we did that last set of scenarios, sort of recognizing that, you know, the sort of collection of countries that you might be able to get together under the current sort of framework to to regulate, you know, put a price on the carbon that sh their share of demand is going to be decreasing over time because the share of emerging and developing countries is increasing over time. So yeah, that's how we... But then I was thinking, uh, if you are consuming a certain amount of oil in uh -huh. developing countries, say, and you, to, ex to expand uh, consumption, say we want to bring uh, natural, well, well, natural gas is a different thing, but we want to bring oil into some other uh, part in, of the country and make production uh, use it there. Uh, wouldn't it uh, maybe be um, cheaper to use new renewable energies instead of building pipes to pump the oil into the new area? And this would maybe reduce the uh, increase in uh, consumption by developing countries. Um, so, so the idea there is, okay, you have basically is capacity constraints in, in terms of your consumption side. And so to allow to access, um, allow growth and demand, you have to make investments in infrastructure of those. But the, I think, for in, well, in, at least in the oil case, oil is primarily used in transportation. And the infrastructure for moving oil around is pretty similar to biofuels. Although electrification can be a different thing, but um, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I have to think that through. Yeah. Just to follow up on, on Andrea's point, then, so a policy implication from this would be that all the resources that are put into energy efficiency is is not a good thing. No, it is. It is a good thing. I think in the in the early green paradox literature, it would be a bad thing because basically anything that reduces future demand, be it you know, a rapidly rising carbon tax, the backstop, or, you know, future innovation and energy efficiency. Anything that reduces future demand encourages resource owners to sell more today. But in, in, once you sort of, you know, get away from that a little bit, so in this context, energy efficiency would be helpful. So think of it a, a, Yeah, so you get, you can, no. Yeah, yeah, no, it would. So if you think of this case again, okay. So you have a uh, regulated country with some carbon price. Think of energy efficiency in this context means that for the same price, they'll be consuming less oil. So then you stay on the lower emissions uh, pool longer, or the low cost pool longer. You switch later to the high cost pool. And from a cost perspective, that trade off with the backstop cost is still the same. So energy efficiency in here means you will consume less of that last pool. So it does, it does reduce emissions. And in, this, and in this kind of case, again, you know, if the regulators are skipping over the last pool, you also get that negative leakage result from energy efficiency. Okay. On top of whatever you would get from, if you're giving them the energy efficiency technology too, then you would also 
get reductions out of the unregulated. But again, so this is why it's important to think about sort of this region where you are wanting to leave stuff in the ground. If you always have exhaustion, if there's a real, always room for every resource pool to just adjust their scarcity costs, then it's hard to do anything about it. But, you know, I, I think it's much more realistic to think about, uh, you know, extractions costs as increasing, marginal costs as increasing with cumulative extraction over time, and then, you know, on that margin you can have an impact.